that. So what do you do when you don't have a perfect test? Because that's what we do most of the, most of the time that we're in practice. We don't have perfect tests. So the first thing you do is you can trend the test, right? And we do that in, in cases of heart disease right now. If somebody's having a heart attack, we get a troponin on them. A troponin only has a 30% sensitivity of picking up um, uh, an injury to the heart. Um, and so what do we do? We check serial troponins. We get multiple troponins and then determine whether or not the patient, whether or not we think the patient is likely to has, has that disease or not. So in this case, um, and here's an example of, of the initial test is a false negative, and then repetitive tests show false, show positive, and you're like, okay, this patient have the, has the disease. So the trend informed you that the patient was, was positive. In this case of a false positive, patient initially tests positive, but doesn't really seem to have any of the other symptoms of the disease. So you keep testing them for whatever various reason that you would, and they test negative and you're like, oh, okay, well, that was, that was, a, that was a false positive, right? And so you're informed based on the serial testing. Um, and those that, that you tested that remain positive and, and, and so on and so forth, are, well, those are the true positives and those that remain negative and don't have the disease, those are the true negatives, right? So this, is, this kind of pattern of testing, this trending analysis is an important way of, of making up for a test that's imperfect. And this is why the feature of how many tests do we have available, how much reagent do we have, how many swabs do we have, what are the actual um, logistic issues with being able to carry out the test is such an important feature. And why we've remained in such a limited capacity to explain to the public what's going on and even to on an individual level to patients whether or not they have the disease or don't. Um, it's because we're limited in this ability to, to trend the test and in many ways early on especially we were turning people away from testing them if they didn't actually have symptoms because we had so few resources to apply that we were having to re rely on a crappy test under crappy conditions and then hope for results that were going to be great, which we know that it's just, it, it's insane to expect it. So, um, you know, this requires a lot of patience on the, uh, on the, on the part of the public with, uh, with our, with our healthcare sector and understanding that this is why we're so cautious, not only in diagnosis, but also in treatment strategies, because we have to follow um, data that's not very good. Now, other than trending the test, you could also use another testing strategy or parameter, right? So if somebody's having a heart attack and the EKG is negative and the troponin's negative, and you are suspicious that they're having the heart attack, well, you can get an echocardiogram to show that a portion of the heart's not moving well, and you're like, oh yeah, okay, there it is, there's the heart attack, right? So you've got another testing strategy. Um, and, and the issue here is we see this in not just using a COVID PCR test, but using a chest X-ray, using a CT scan of the chest, using other features that also offer additional modes of trying to make the diagnosis clinically and not necessarily from an, a, a genetic basis. And so genetic tests play, have an important role in the diagnosis, but they're not the, only, they're not the only tool in the shed. And so using another testing strategy is how you make up for an imperfect test. Um, and then the last part is also reminding that we make decisions clinically. The pattern of disease fits irrespective of tests, so you treat accordingly to the pattern of disease that you're seeing and what your clinical understanding and suspicion and acumen is. And this is where being a good physician and, and a good PA really makes a difference in somebody's life is that you still maintain your clinical wherewithal of being able to understand how to recognize a disease and treat a disease specific to that situation. So you have a test, but there are two different types of perspectives that are applied. The test, it can be at the patient level, which is a diagnostic level. You're informing decision-making about the patient has a disease or I need to treat because of the test result was this, or I need to not treat because the test result was that. Um, and so that's a very different perspective than at the population level. Right? At the population level where we're doing surveillance, the test is being used to predict health resource needs. It's being used to predict what the burden of disease is. It's being used to predict how will this affect, how much of the workforce is gonna be affected by this disease being present. Right? Those larger population questions through surveillance are being asked. It's a completely different perspective. 
And so, but it's the same test, right? So here's an example of that, right? We're gonna use a test, we're gonna use a thermometer, check somebody's temperature. Um, and from the data, we know that 50% of the patients out on admission have a fever. So, um, and if we look at that, we'd say, well, okay, well, if one out of a thousand people tested um, had a fever, then, well, I guess two out of a thousand have the disease. But that's a false assumption because fever has many other causes. So that test wasn't that helpful. But if we looked at, at the genetic test in this case, with, with similarly just a 50% sensitivity, there's many false negatives there, right? But there's a high specificity of this test. So if you have 200 cases out of 1,000, it's more likely that you could double that and that you actually have 400 cases out of 1,000 because you know the sensitivity is only 50%. And so the perspective on looking at the population changes, right? For that patient who tested, 50, like that's 50-50 that they have the disease or they don't based on the patient level. But from the population level, you can begin to use that information and to impute what you think the likely burden of disease is. And this, why, this is how a crappy test can be more beneficial on a population level and less beneficial on a diagnostic level. And we're seeing that now where we are having patients coming in who are getting PCR tested because we think they have the disease and we're trying to use this as a diagnostic tool. But then we're also testing people who we don't suspect have the disease because we're doing a surveillance of the hospital population to figure out well, how many people in the hospital um, have this disease and don't know that they have it. And that perspective is a very different perspective and it can be confusing to those of us that are, that are in practice. And we're seeing that confuse a whole bunch of different people. It's confusing the nurses, it's confusing the, the, um, the people in charge of bed control and uh, the um, decisions of where to place a patient in the hospital. It's confusing to the uh, practitioners upstairs um, and it's confusing to the skilled nursing facilities for accepting people, right? Well, a lot of these features are, are, are creating a great deal of confusion and making it difficult to communicate clearly with each other and so Really, that was, again, one of the reasons I wanted to have this talk. Um, 